Hello everyone, welcome to my session on Simulus MLOps with Sheldon and MLflow. You may be wondering who am I? Well, my name is Adrian. I, I, I'm i a machine learning engineer at Sheldon. I joined Sheldon around a year ago. Before that, I took a master's in, in machine learning. And before that, I spent my time mostly uh, working as a software engineer across different startups. That's why my interest has usually been in this intersection between engineering and machine learning. Uh, you may also be wondering, what is Seldon? Well, Seldon is, is, is a startup that focuses on building open source uh, tools for the productionization and monitoring of models, of machine learning models. Uh, we are currently hiring, so please do hit me out if you have any questions or want more details on that. So, what are we going to see today? Well, first of all, we're going to start by introducing the MLOps problem and why is it hard. I'm aware most of you have probably heard about, about I probably have heard already about MLOps. Uh, however, I do think it's useful still to, to kind of uh, put the context to, together so that we can all share the same base. Uh, we will also have a look at MLflow and Selden, and we will see how they can interact to help with this MLOps problem, help with managing the machine learning lifecycle. At the end, we will see a quick demo, uh, seeing how both play together. So first things first, what do we mean by MLOps? Well, I find it useful to kind of consider the alternative. So let's first assume that we don't have any MLOps. So, so you get thrown or you get asked to build a machine learning model for a particular problem. The first thing you do is you go and find the data set and then you spin up your Jupyter Notebook instance and you start uh, training different versions of your model and you start comparing them between them. However, usually you pretty soon realize that, well, this process as is doesn't a scale and also you realize that uh, training by itself is usually not the end goal. You, after training, you want to put your model in production, you want to expose your model to people, and then you also realize that before training you actually had to run a lot of scripts to, to pre-process your data. And there is, you need to find a way to see how you can actually manage this process in, 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 in you know, wide scale. And in fact, if you drill down into each of these steps, you soon see that there are a lot of sub steps involved. And for example, if you look into data processing, you need to think about the data lineage and how to manage your workflow. If you think about training, you need to think about uh, how to track your different experiment runs, how to track the output of each one of them. And then if you think about serving, uh, you need to think about things like monitoring your model. How is your model performing in production? MLOps essentially focuses on this and, and how to manage these larger machine learning lifecycle uh, uh, production scale. Another way to put it, according to Wikipedia, and I know that you shouldn't quote Wikipedia, but I really like this definition. MLOps is a practice for collaboration and communication between data scientists and operations professionals to help manage production machine learning lifecycle. Great, so that sounds great. Everyone wants that. Everyone wants that larger machine learning lifecycle for their models. However, as we mentioned before, this problem is hard. Why is it hard? Well, we need to think that each one of these steps usually has a very wide range of requirements. So for example, if we think of data processing, usually you need some sort of massive distributed architecture to process your data at a scale. If you think about training, you may not need that at all. However, you need GPUs or TPUs. You, need special, you may need a specialized infrastructure for training. And then when you move to inference, you may not need any of that. Uh, because maybe your model at inference time is way more efficient. Or maybe not. It depends also between models and between model toolkits. We also need to think that some of these steps are actually very technically challenging. So for example, if we think about monitoring, monitoring in the context of machine learning usually means things like detecting outlier instances or detecting concept drift between our inference time data set and our training data set. These by themselves a hard problem. So when you think about scaling this process up across every machine learning model in your organization, then it becomes crazy hard. And then at the root of all of these problems, we also have a huge organizational challenge, which uh, in my opinion is actually the cause of all of these actual problems and what actually makes the problem hard. To kind of illustrate what I mean by that, we can think of what DevOps was trying to solve when it first originated. So essentially the DevOps movement tried to solve the massive barrier that organizations had between the software engineering team and the DevOps team. So essentially whenever software engineers 
finish their work, they would just throw it away to the to the DevOps team or sysadmin team who would then be responsible of picking that up and running it. And doing that without having any idea what was inside that packet. If we think about this on machine learning context, we now have not two, but four, at the very least, different silos, different teams that need to communicate between them to kind of at different steps and in different manners of this machine learning life cycle. So how can we make com communication between these departments easier? How can we break up these silos? For that, we can take recipes from the DevOps movement. So one of them, for example, is automate everything, build pipelines, build workflows. Sorry, because more automation means less communication, i.e. more efficiency. Also measure and monitor everything on your pipeline. Monitor how much time your training runs take, how many resources do they need, how many requests your model is getting in production, what is the speed of that? Because all of these metrics can inform back the process to improve it further. further. Also, shift left on everything, for example, on responsibilities. For example, the, the DevOps movement, one of its, of its core beliefs was, well, let's empower engineers to own their workloads in production. If we take this to MLOps, it could mean something like, let's empower data scientists to own their training pipelines, to own their production models themselves. And by this, I don't mean just giving them, giving them access to a full Kubernetes cluster, but instead what I mean is give them the right tooling so that they can own these workloads while keeping the actual infrastructure details hidden from them and letting that those under, under, underneath layers be managed by the respective teams like, like data engineers or DevOps people. So what tools do we have available for this? And if we go, for example, to this repo, like uh, the, its name is called the Awesome Production Machine Learning Repo, and it's, it's maintained by a, by a colleague of mine, Alejandro Salcedo, you can see that there is a huge number of tools that allow you to manage this process, as in a crazy number of tools, and maybe you don't need all of them. Regardless of that, I do encourage you to check out the repo. It's, it's really good. It has a really good summary of all of the things that are out there. A different view into this problem is this graphic that Dan Jeffers from Packeter put together, and he put it together in this blog post, which I also encourage you to check out. And it essentially illustrates a couple of a few tools, a few open source tools that specialize in some of the steps of this machine learning lifecycle. Out of these tools, we're going to focus today on how MLflow and Selden can play their part on improving how the management of this MLOps lifecycle. So in particular, we're going to see how MLflow can be used for training and provide a unified abstraction layer for training, whereas Seldon, Seldon Core can focus on serving and how it can unify a unify how can it unify the deployment layer for your models. We're going to leave aside for today the data processing side, but if you want to have a deeper look into that, you can look into tools like Pachyderm or or Databricks, to or you can even combine these together to for your data processing needs. So let's go first with MLflow and how we can perform training with MLflow. So MLflow is an open source project that was initially started by Databricks. They, a year ago, they donated it to the LFAI, the Linux Foundation for Artificial Intelligence. And it's essentially an open source platform to manage the, 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 the ML lifecycle, including experimentation and reproducibility and a central model registry. How does it actually work? Well. MLflow has a number of components to kind of manage this life cycle. One of them, which is probably the central one, is the MLflow project. So essentially the MLflow, MLflow project encodes your machine learning project environment and it instructs MLflow on how it should interface with your training infrastructure and your training code. From this file and this specification, you, MLflow has enough information to kick off training runs. Now, these training runs are usually characterized by a set of hyperparameter uh, values that are the input to your experiment that you would set in your model and by a set of, of metrics that you consider you take as the performance of your model. So, for example, like R2 or, or accuracy, etc. These metrics 
would get stored into the centralized storage it's called the mlflow tracking which would essentially keep track of all of your experiment runs and your experiment iterations another output of each one of these iterations is your train model that mlflow would serialize using this unified format called mlflow model each one of these instances would can get persisted into some kind of, of remote storage or even a local file system. So something like S3 or MinIO usually would be used in production. And essentially what they are is the serialized, your serialized model weights alongside any, alongside the environment on which they were trained on and alongside some of the, some metadata like who trained that model. On top of this, you can have the MLflow registry, which is a second API alongside the MLflow tracking one, would essentially, essentially would expose some metadata information about its model. So for example, is this model ready for production or not? So essentially we have these four components and today we can, we can have a deeper look into the first and the third one, into the MLflow project and the MLflow model. So the MLflow project is essentially encoded in a file named ML project, which is essentially a YAML file. And the YAML file has things like, uh, where is my Conda environment? Here you can point to an environment.yaml or conda.yaml file with your dependencies. And what are the hyperparameter inputs of my model of my training code? Here we have two of them. And also how can MLflow interact and call your training code? Which is what we have here. Once you have that, you can then kick off experiment runs by just uh, running in your terminal ML, MLflow run and setting the values of the hyperparameters. The output of this is another file, a second file, well, it's actually a second folder where one of the files, the core file, is the ML model file, which essentially holds some of the information that is necessary later to, well, first of all, to track that snapshot to the experiment run that generated it and to give instructions for whatever you have later in the, in the pipeline to load back that model to run inference. For example, we can see that it has a run ID, which would link it back to an experiment run. And it has information on how was this model serialized, which is enough to deserialize it back and run inference at the later state. And that's exactly what we want to do next. We want to take this, the output of training, which would essentially be each of these ML model blocks and serve that and for that, we're going to use Seldon. So first things first, what is Seldon, in particular Seldon Core? Well, Seldon Core is an open source project that was created by Seldon. And it essentially is essentially an MLOps framework that allows you to deploy, monitor, and manage your machine learning models. What do we mean here exactly? So another view into this is it allows you to go very easily from a set of model weights, model binary artifacts into an exposed model, model server. Now this, this model could be something as simple as just a single model, or it could be a more complex, what we call an inference graph, which is essentially a graph that, com that is built upon different steps that are required for inference. This could be things like doing some kind of feature transformation, which can be particularly relevant in NLP use cases when you want to translate a text into an embedding, for example. And it could go down into things like having uh, multiple versions of your model and having like some sort of a smart routing mechanism like multi arm banded model responsible just for routing between different versions of your model. So long is designed to run on top of Kubernetes and it leverages Kubernetes heavily. This means that we can offload to Kubernetes a lot of the problems that usually come alongside serving like a scaling, uh, machine resource management, etc. And it also means that we that Seldon can be deployed across all major cloud providers because most of them, all of them, I think, actually offer some sort of Kubernetes managed platform. You can also run it on top of things like OpenShift, which are essentially on-prem equivalent of a Kubernetes managed platform or other Kubernetes distributions like Case 3s I think. How does this actually work? Well, we have a deeper look into, into Seldon Core. Essentially the, the core component, the atomic component which Seldon Core works with is 
the cell on deployment custom resource. Now, a custom resource or a custom re resource definition or a CRD is Kubernetes terminology for a custom abstraction of some sort of, archi of architectural pattern that you want to deploy in your cluster. So for example, here, it would be encoding a model and how to deploy a model into your cluster as a custom resource, a custom ab abstraction. So essentially it offers you this, you can treat this as the main API which you interact with of, of Seldon. And it, it gives this, it, you can treat this as a unified layer for deployment, for your model deployment. Within this custom resource, you can see the main specific things like graph. Here you can, you can define your inference graph. And again, this inference graph could be something as simple as a single model, as we will see later in the demo, or it could be something more complex like we've got here. Here we've got different steps. We're not gonna dive much into this, but we can focus on this one, for example, this node that is named classifier. And we can see that it has, that it specifies as implementation MLflow server, and that it has a pointer to this remote URI with our model weights. And essentially here what it says is telling Seldon that I, I, it's gonna use, that these weights were generated by MLflow, therefore it's gonna use the MLflow inference server to spin up this model. What happens when we deploy this, this into our cluster is that Seldon would be watching about, upon these resources, would see that a new resource has been created in, in the cluster, and from here it would create all the necessary Kubernetes resources to expose your model. This could be uh, pods, and, well, container deployments, uh, services, and any ingress resource to expose it and to make it accessible from the outside. So for example, here we have a deep focus into this into the generated pod for this particular cell on deployment, where we can see how each of the nodes of our inference graph has been created as a node on uh, as, a, as a container in our pod. We will also have other sidecar containers that get injected and then help with, with other things like downloading the remote set of weights or making sure that the requests flow through the inference graph in the correct manner. Also, using, by using this abstraction, it, we also simplify uh, the addition of, for example, complex things like explainers or other patterns like setting up outlier detectors. And this can all be handled through this unified deployment layer. We don't have time to cover all of this. However, we can focus on a couple of them, mainly because we will see them later in the demo. So for example, if we look at the inference server, Seldon comes with a set of prepackaged inference servers. These know how to read model weights serialized by a set of common machine learning frameworks, for example, TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn or MLflow. So for example, we, that means that we could deploy a custom resource. Well, we only have to specify, here are my model weights, which could be a remote cloud storage. And this is the implementation that I'm gonna use. This is the inference server that I'm gonna use, MLflow. Or the same thing for other uh, ML toolkits. For example, this is where my weights are. These are weights that have been generated by Exiboost. And therefore, we're gonna use the Exiboost implementation. You also have control to define and to implement your own uh, Python runtime, your own custom Python runtime, if you want to. And you can register it and so that you can use it as easy as the prepackaged one, as easily. All the things that are exposed through the Seldon deployment CR is an integration with Prometheus. Now, Prometheus is a open source, cloud native, uh, time series database designed for metrics. Out of the box, Seldon will expose a set of metrics like memory uh, and CPU and latency, or a few other things that Prometheus will just scrap and, and build its own uh, internal data and internal consistency about how that model is performing. However, this is usually not the end of the picture for monitoring and particularly in machine learning you usually have uh, more advanced metrics that you do need to, to monitor and you need to keep track of. Things like uh, being able to detect the number of outliers that are coming into your model, being able to detect the accuracy, if you have access to some sort of ground truth of how your model is performing, etc. Now for this, leveraging the concept of reusable inference servers would be a bit narrow, a bit conscripted, because it would essentially force you to define new and to create new images for each set of custom images. So instead, what we have built 
is an integration with Knative. Now, Knative allows you to build asynchronous monitoring pipelines in Kubernetes. This means that whenever inference happens in your model, you can send that back to the user, and under the hood, Salon will also trigger an event that can be picked up by any Knative component. Now, this Knative component could be something like an outlier detection uh, model that is essentially going to keep track, going to measure if the input data coming into your model has was an outlier. It's just going to report that back to Prometheus. It could be things like drip detection uh, or, or things like any kind of custom metrics. The first two are powered by this really cool library that we've also created, well, the data science team has created called Alibi Detect. I really encourage you to also check it out. It can be used besides Selden. It's also open source. And it implements a few a set of algorithms already. Uh, it has a few set. It has a set of algorithms pre-implemented for outlier detection, concept-driven detection, a few other uh, monitoring aspects in machine learning. So deep diving into this architectural pattern, any time every time your user sends a request, inference would happen. Inference would happen as if it, there wasn't any, and under the hood, it's just going to kick off this event asynchronously. This event could get picked up by any kind of custom metric server, which would then report these metrics back to Prometheus. Now, with all these metrics in Prometheus, we can use something like Grafana to expose them and to visualize them, or we could use something like Alert Manager that is also that also ships with Prometheus, actually, I think, to alert us of any whenever any threshold of our model performance has been has been reached, like number of outliers. Additionally, through the seldom deployment custom research, you can also specify advanced deployment strategies. Now, this is particularly relevant for machine learning because it's usually hard to say if, for example, let's say that during training, a model performs much better than another model. It's hard to say if that's going to correlate with the same performance in production, basically because you don't know how your production data is going to look like. So for that, you can deploy, you would usually follow strategies like uh, deploying two models in an A-B test or splitting the traffic between them or strategies like shadow deployments. Now, the cell deployment custom resource allows you to do this and exposes this as, as, as predictors, as the concept of predictors. So you can have multiple predictors in your cell deployment custom resource. Here, for example, we've got two of them and we send 50% of the traffic to each one. Now, all of these, plus a few other uh, uh, features, have uh, demos and, and more details in the Seldon doc. So I highly encourage you to check those out. And I also encourage you to, if you have any doubts, to, well, to ping me or to join the Seldon community Slack channel. Now, we have seen, uh, we have introduced MLflow, we have introduced Seldon. We have seen how both can play together in theory. Let's see an actual demo that puts all of this together. So we're going to use this example of uh, wine e-commerce. So we're going to assume that we want to build a website that is going to sell bottles of wine. We want to provide a score for each one of the wines. So for that, we're going to train a model. And further to that, we want to listen to feedback about customers. So customers are going to also provide a score about bottles of wine that they bought. And we're going to see, and we're going to signal, we're going to see how its model performs based on the difference between the, the score that we predicted and the score that users actually gave us for a particular bottle of wine. To do that, the first step is going to be getting a data set. And for that, we're going to use this, this existing wine quality data set. It essentially has a few, the feature, the input features would be attributes of the wine. And then the value that we want to predict is the quality of the wine. It's a regression problem. We're going to use this elastic net model, which is essentially linear regression with a couple of, of hyperparameters with an L1 and L2 regularizers that control how the weight of each one of these of, of this penalty. So it's a hyperparameter would control each one of the regularizers. And we're going to use MLflow for training. So for that, we're going to define an MLflow project, uh, which is going to be, uh, it's going to define our environment for our wine problem. And we're going to run a couple of experiments. We're going to keep track of those in MLflow tracking. And we're going to log the output of each one of these as model A and model B. Uh, if we were to have MLflow correctly configured, this would go out into Google Cloud Storage. However, for the simplicity of the demo, for the sake of simplicity, we haven't. Also because I'm a bit lazy. So instead, we're going to store these weights 
locally, and we're just going to push them manually to Google Cloud Storage. Now we're going to have these two models. We don't know, it's not clear which one is, is going to be better in production because there is this mismatch between training data set and inference data set. So we're going to deploy both with Seldon and we're going to run an A-B test. And this A-B test, on top of this A-B test, we're going to also provide users feedback. How do we do that? Well, the Seldon deployment custom resource will just contain these two models and we're going to say, it's just going to say that it's going to, there's going to be a 50-50 split between them. These models are just going to fetch the weight from as the output of animal flow training as is. And then we're going to take into account the user's feedback to see which one performs better. And by which one performs better, I mean uh, which one has a higher reward and as a rough reward signal, sort of a proxy metric for how well the model is performing, we're just going to use something based on the uh, squared error between what the model is predicting and the user's feedback. And afterwards, we're going to be able to see in Grafana how these models are actually performing one against the other. All of this is in this GitHub repo, so let's split, split, feel free to check it out and ask me if you have any questions. So. We, I've got here this Jupyter Notebook with the demo. I've got my environment already set up. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to define, we're going to create an ML project file, which is, which is again, going to define the environment of our model. So in here, we can see that it points to a conda.yaml file and that it points to a train py script that we're going to use as our training code. We can actually look at that very quickly. So we've got on the left hand side, the ML flow train py script. And we can see that it just it needs to interact with MLflow in a couple of points. So in here, which is where it's going to lock the parameter, the hyperparameters of our model, i.e. the input values for this training run, it's gonna, it's, it just needs to lock the metrics as in the output of our training run, or how well it, it went, and it's going to lock our model. And then we can also have a look at the conda.yaml file, which is going to define our environment. And in here, we could specify anything, any dependency that we needed for our uh, training code and our inference code to work. With that, the next step is going to be to kick off these training runs. I haven't already done that uh, in the before. So we already have a few of them. So essentially, it's one of these. It's a folder that has an ML model a snapshot of our model and code it into an ML model file as the output of its tra training run. We can actually look into the MLflow UI to see these different runs. And now the next step is going to be to deploy two of them. And I think it's this two, it's going to be these two. And in fact, we can look at how each one of these folders actually has this ML model file. Also, as I mentioned before, we are going to push them manually to Google Cloud Storage. I have already done that, so we can skip this step now. The next step is to deploy them. For that, we need to create, uh, to define a seldom deployment custom resource. So you can see how this resource, essentially, is very similar to what we saw before. It essentially has this graph component, which now is just going to consist of a single model. And it just says, well, I've got this model weights, and then I'm going to use the MLflow server implementation to deploy them. And this model A is going to get 50% of the traffic. You can also see here something that we didn't have before. This is essentially it's a bunch of config, which is just saying to just telling Kubernetes, it's fine if this model takes a bit more time to spin up. Now, why do we need that? Well, if you remember uh, what I mentioned before, this content.yaml can be is completely dynamic. That means, and it's a story alongside our ML model file. That means that we don't know our model's environment until we fetch these weights, this set of weights that also contain the environment information. And that forces us, that has the, the trade, the trade-off is between uh, how dynamic we want our environment to be and how quickly our pod is going to spin up. For the simplicity of the demo, we are going to think, well, we have decided that it's fine if it takes a bit more time to come up, but using our production setting, you would just uh, pay this cost early on by building an image that has all of the dependencies that you know your model is going to have and it's keeping that step of dynamically generating the model every time you deploy the, the environment sorry every time you deploy a new model now the second predictor it would also it will be very similar the only difference is that it's going to point to the weights of model b it also has 50 percent of the traffic 
And it has the same chunk of code because it has the same problem of dynamically generating the environment. Now, once we have that, we can just run kubectl apply to deploy it into our cluster. So we can do that. And now we can look into our cluster and we can see that we just created a seldom deployment, which is called Wines Classifier. So the, should be Wines Regressor. But anyway, we can look into the pods created into our cluster and we can see that it's creating two pods, one for each of our models. And here you can see that it's actually instantiating each of these containers. Now here is generating this conda environment dynamically. That is something that can take a while. So to keep things short, I've got a second namespace here where we've got our models already created. Now we have these two pods. You may be wondering, well, where is the A-B test? Where is the traffic splitting happening? Well, Seldon integrates with Istio to kind of create a virtual service that actually splits the traffic between these two pods. So out of the box, it works with Istio and it works with Ambassador. You can see here then how the virtual service of Istio, of your ingress layer, is actually splitting this traffic between these two. Now, Seldon does that in the ingress layer, mainly because in this, in this specific scenario is more efficient. If you had something more complicated, like a multi-arm bandit router, it wouldn't happen in the Istio ingress, obviously. Now, the next thing is going to be testing if these models actually work. So for that, we're just going to send a request, which is going to be com compressed of the input data. And if, if you, if we can know that here it follows the actual, uh, the model, the, the seldom payload for, for inference requests. So we can send a request and we can see that it's working. And we can see that in fact, it's predicting uh, the quality of our wine as 5.5 or 5.6. The next thing that we're going to do is introduce this feedback loop. Now, because we obviously don't have a wine e-commerce and we don't have any users, we are going to simulate this traffic by just reading the different rows of our uh, CSV training set. And we're going to get the predicted value of each one of them by our model, by each one of, the, of our models. And we're going to provide as feedback as the user's score for that, the actual score of the one according to our training data set. So the, this difference between both is going to be our reward signal. Which is basically that what you can see here. So here we would, we would just be sending that feedback back to our model. Now I've got that running already in the background. So if we sit, switch here to Grafana, we should be able to see how it's actually just generating a set of rewards uh, for each one of the models. So we've got these graphs which are representing the reward for each one of our models. So we've got, I think yellow is model B and green is model A. And we can see here that it's actually pretty spotty. And however, we don't want to use these reward peaks of model B, I imagine. So in this case, we would just promote model B to be our single model running and we'll just remove the, that. And just to for the sake of, of showing you how to do that, you would just need to mod to remove if you just want model B, which is the second one, you would just need to remove the first predictor from the cell on deployment CR and just redeploy that and that would be it. Well and also remove the traffic. Just send it hundred percent of the traffic. Now that's pretty much all of what I do today. So thanks a lot for joining. I hope you have enjoyed this talk. Uh, I'm, just to remind you, we are hiring. So please do hit me if you've got any questions. And, and that's it. Thanks very much for joining. <laughs>